welcoming everybody here. I also want to recognize the one elected official. I, I Um, let me, um, my name is Matt Gonzalez, and seated next to me are Peter Camillo and Mike Feinstein. I think they're well known to the audience. Peter, um, uh, both these men have a long history with the party. Peter most recently uh, was a running mate with Ralph Nader, an uh, independent candidacy, and he was uh, the Green Party candidate uh, for governor in both the last governor's race and the recall uh, race. And of course, Mike Feinstein is the former mayor of Santa Monica. Um, I think they've both been leaders in the party. I'm looking forward to hearing their comments today. And um, it's been billed as a debate, and I'd like to try to uh, find a way of doing a debate, but also having audience participation. And we're not going to be um, too precious about uh, some of the general rules of formal debates where everybody's got to get the exact time in this and that. We're going to uh, be uh, giving each speaker an opportunity to give about an opening, a 15 minute opening. And um, depending on how that goes, we'll kind of harvest uh, some of the remarks or questions. We may give the original speaker a little bit of time to respond to the second speaker if that seems appropriate. And we'll try to flow like that. Jim Dorncock is going to be the timekeeper. I've asked Jim to, um, you know, set the time if he puts up a stop. But if either of these gentlemen are, are making good points or there's good clash, we're going to let it let it run a little bit. Once we ask a question and kind of let the uh, Mr. Kamehameha Feinstein kind of hash it out, uh, we're going to hopefully make it. Uh, available for members of the audience and this is how we're going to try to do it rather than having a very strict their period is over now let's go to the audience we're going to try to bring the audience into parts of the debate and then get their responses to things I don't know that it's going to work but we'll give it a try um, so if there is a particular question on a subject and you want to jump into that debate once they've hashed it out we'll take a question or two from the audience and then get their response it might be a comment from the audience in that, uh, let's see how it goes. Okay, the, um, there was a uh, coin toss, and Peter will begin uh, with his opening statement. Thank you, man. Um, I have prepared, as a byproduct of a meeting we had, a uh, strategy for the campaign. Campaign 2006 strategy, and I want to just make sure everybody's gotten this and gets a chance to read it. Uh, we're facing an exceptional opportunity uh, this year, and I think in 2008 it will be multiplied. We now see, as I mentioned yesterday from the New York Times, that the majority of the people now have turned against the war. And when you think of the context of the fact that Bush is not only crashing in the polls, and so is Arnold, that we have, at least in California, very clearly stood our ground and said that the answer is not these Democrats who gave Bush 39 standing ovations. So we have a great opportunity if we continue to present ourselves to the public as very principled, clear, and unambiguous, and expose the role of the Democratic Party. It's pro-war politics and pro-patriot, in fact, it's against immigration, because what we want to say to the people when they turn against the policies of the government is that by playing this two-party game, you don't solve any of these problems. They're always there. And they'll always have the other party to replace the other one when things start going wrong. This is it. Today, we need to have a, a, a take advantage of this opening. But I'm proposing a different strategy than we've ever had before. I want our campaign to be deeply linked with the living movements. This is the way it should be always, but now especially, it's becoming stronger the possibilities. And in this proposal, I give some specifics of the type of things we need to begin to do. We must also use the campaign to try to change the Green Party, to make it grow, to become a different type of Green Party. We want to involve a lot more Latinos and African Americans 
and, and Muslims, we really need to do a very powerful reach out and then to try to consolidate that. We need to look to make sure that our county councils really represent the green membership. Uh, it's perfect, it's nobody's fault, but it's in growth always happens in all organizations. The Green Party is a living organism. It was born, it gets sick, it gets well, it takes medicine, it transforms, it grows, and one day it will die. Because everything of an end. But the end could be that we win and we transform America, etc. <laughs> we need to turn to the people who have been voting for us and to the people who are open to our party and are starting to support us in this campaign. And I allow it here, I won't repeat much of it, because I want to focus in on some of the problems we have in the Green Party. There is a big political division in the Green Party, and that's normal. By the way, the abolitionists fought each other and hated each other, and populists were always fighting each other. This is human nature. If you're going to try to build an organization that challenges this society, there's going to be difference. Learning how to deal with those differences is another question, which really has to be thought out. How do you handle it? You've got to be for openness. People should always put their positions in writing. One thing that I'm uh, criticized for is that I do that all the time. I always put it right and send it out to everybody what I think we should do. I think that is how people should act. But there is a current now in the Green Party I disagree with very strongly, and that is the lesser evil. Those who want to endorse Democrats, who believe that we should vote for Kerry, etc. There was a statement by 18 leading Greens calling for lesser evil voting. And then things began to happen. John Eder, our highest elected official in Parliament, in, a, in the state legislature in uh, Maine, publicly announced that he will vote for Kerry. On our website of our presidential candidate, it said, vote Kerry. But, you know, to me, that is shocking. Kerry doesn't agree with any of our 10 points. He is consciously pro-war, pro, -war, pro uh, the Patriot Act. He's against everything we stand for. And if we're Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Animal rights. It's Animal rights. Look, you could see this begin in 2003 when I ran for governor. Green sending me letters. Oh, please don't do that. I got a whole bunch of them. Uh, and Medea Benjamin endorses Ariana Huffington. And when Ariana Huffington goes over to the Democrats and joins the Davis campaign, no comment. No comment from any of these people. PBA, the Democrats formed this new left thing which they do every 20 years and they usually last about 10 years and they're always utter failures because it's a corporate controlled and run party. PBA is involved more than the Green Party. But you go to the PBA website today and you'll hear David Cobb and Medea Benjamin, two Greens, promoting the Democratic Party. In Oklahoma, they openly table for the Democrats. In Utah, those Greens who are against lesser evil were suddenly declared out of the party. The party has split in Utah, and the majority, the ones who are on the ballot, are now excluded from the party without any trial, presentation, discussion, or vote. They've been expelled from the party. That's a deep problem in our party. In Ohio, just last week, a group of Greens get together in Cincinnati and try to hold the first Green meeting in that section, and Greens who are pro lesser evil pick at them and say that people shouldn't join the Green Party there because they're pro GDI, for Greens for Democracy and Independence which is the majority current in our party in California. And now has appeared a new concept. Cross-voting, fusion. There's many words for it. But what it means, what it's a little different from less of evil, is not that just that we endorse Democrats, but we put registered Democrats on our ballot. Now, when Mike Feinstein said that to 100 Greens in um, Silmar, I was sitting there and I thought to myself, this is a current point of view that is developing in our party. Pro-fusion now exists in Santa, Ro uh, Santa Fe in New Mexico, and some of the leadership in Maine favor this. So this is going to be with us. And, and this process, you can see it. I mean, you take a person like, who I love very much, great activist, green activist, Magali Hufferman, who's a GDI supported native. Now she writes, we should not run campaigns against the Democratic Party. It's like Phil Huckleberry, who got up at the plenary and said, we did not join the Green Party to oppose the Democrats. So we have two very different strategies. 
And it's like two ships passing in the night. Well, some Greens are starting to say, oh no, we, we should orient to these people, the PDA and these liberal Democrats. It's not, we should be orienting to the people who vote for us, for the African Americans, the Latinos, and the unemployed, and the poor people in the state. But they should do it as individuals, as a grouping. That's their opinion. We give Greens total freedom. I believe in that, complete openness. Let Greens do what they want to do. But the party, as an institution, does not endorse the pro corporate candidates. Democrats are ready to do it. Sure. They're also ready to recruit us like the Senate to leave the Green Party. Yeah. You gotta remember his video. I'm gonna win the Greens back to the Democratic Party. That's what PDA's all about. Three, four hundred thousand people broke with them. Almost three million voted for Nader, the largest vote to the left of the two corporate parties since the early First World War efforts, unless you count the Wallace event in which was another story in 1948, there has been no such vote by the people. This is the beginning. And so while this current in the Green Party is moving towards, oh, well, we have to make peace with the Democrats, we've got to be like it used to be where they didn't criticize us. There are people moving the other way, like Nativo Lopez. Nativo Lopez, right while the ABB stuff was going on, where you can't vote for it, you have to vote for Kerry, he registered Greens and declares against him and stands up. There, that is a counter-current. People are becoming furious about the war. They're becoming furious on other issues. Our party will go away. The Free Soil Party, the Greenback Labor Party, the Populist Party, all who died because of fusion. All who died because of cross-voting. All who died because the minute you do that, your base, the people who are for you, do not understand that. They begin to think, well, if they support Democrats, and I guess I should stay in the Democratic Party, instead of we have to be very principled and say there's a crisis in the world. And this crisis Peter, is brought up by the control of money. I'm sorry, Peter, let me interrupt you. The timekeeper is showing you two minutes, but I show you have six minutes left, so I think we have to. Why don't you keep going? Green time. That's just my introduction. I'm starting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, that cost me a lot of money to get Matt to do that. I don't know. <laughs> if that's your introduction, you need to speed it up, but you got six minutes. <laughs> I, got six I just I just fought for four minutes for you. The, this issue, this problem we have in the Green Party is reflected in many levels. We should try to be very sensitive to our membership, and we should take these issues. You know, I would love for my clients to run for governor against me, and we'd go all over the state and teach people how you debate ideas and how you do it, you know, without personal insults and so forth. Just get out there and say your politics, and then what? Let the membership vote. And when then we should respect those votes. Right now, the GDI community is the majority. The majority of our coordinating council and of our representation to the national should be majority GDI in respect to our membership. And we, we have to have proportional representation and respect the currents that appear. And if a pro-fusionist wins, wins, then the anti-fusionist will fight to change people's mind and try to convince people and respect that. And people always have the right to form another party if they want, but the Green Party must be super democratic and completely open. People have to be free to say what they want, to organize their current, to run. It doesn't hurt when two Greens run against each other in the primary. It actually gives us more voices out there talking about the issues. And when people see that we can handle differences and that we have differences, you know, in 2003 a website was set up by Greens Against Me. And the media came running to me, there's a website by Greens Against You. How did I answer? I said, more power to them. And I want everybody to read it. And please print it in your article how to get on their website. Because that's the type of party we are. We don't tell people they can't criticize their candidate or whatever. We love that. What the Democrats will never do. Because then will be out there supporting candidates.
Kerry no matter what Kerry says. Kerry calls, Kerry calls for destroying collusion. Because, you, know, you know, I think the lesser evil argument could be made. And, and I'm thinking of it as a parody joke, you know. I, I disagree with lesser evil because I think that Bush is just as bad as Kerry. <laughs> <laughs> Kerry, said, Kerry said destroy Fallujah. He did it. Bush did it. You weren't going to, okay, okay, the Democrats started the war in Vietnam and the Republicans ended it. But don't be fooled by that. The Republicans are no better than the Democrats. <laughs> I mean, you can go around and around on this stuff. You've got to understand that it isn't two separate parties. It's a system in yeah. place that functions and that needs You, they give George Bush 39 standing ovations, but the Democrats, when they go out, they don't give pro Bush speeches. No, they go, you're against the war. So am I. I voted for Republicans, but no, it's that we're there. We have to stay because we're there. It's like somebody rocks your house and they're, well, they're already inside. <laughs> Maybe a gradual withdrawal. They take something from the kitchen. Then. <laughs> Logical issues which we have to fight, but we cannot. Two hours, okay. Um, <laughs> we will not build our party, and I'll tell you, it is the beginning of the end, in my opinion. <laughs> if we do what Mike Feinstein's proposing, and what at our last um, plenary, when we voted on the GDI, people were yelling, give cross voting a chance. Listen, the Democrats, Republicans, they had their chance. If there was anything they were going to do in this country to make it a real democracy, to protect the interests of the poor, to stop exploiting people all over the world and invading them, they would have long done it. What we need to do is raise a voice in this society and understand we may be like the early abolitionists. It may not be until another whole generation before the mass breakthroughs, but we want them to remember. What do you think they're going to remember 50 years from now? The Greens stood up. They opposed the war. They said these two parties were both corrupt. Not, oh, and then the Greens had some Democrats run in their ballot, and then they supported some Democrats. No. no, what we remember about the abolitionists is when Bernie, the Liberty Party, ran their first candidate, and he said, no vote for either of the parties that support slavery. Ever. And that was this wonderful people, primarily from northern New York, that take that stand. And you know, I always like to talk about Venezuela now that something very incredible is happening there. When the press and ambassador to the United States in Venezuela was here in Oakland, what is it he told us? We're winning in Venezuela because we never support the two major parties. We never endorse them. We tell the people we're here. <laughs> of the vote and the two major parties collapsed to 5% and the collapse was so total that in the last week of the campaign both of their candidates withdrew and said we're not running, we're not running, so like don't count our vote for what it's going to be. That will come to pass in the United States if we stay principled and do not engage in fusion. Thanks everyone. Thanks to the Alameda County Greens for showing leadership to host this gathering. I think this was really critical for us to have a non-business meeting with all the internal difficulties we've had over the last couple of years. The time for us to have related this fall was in this sort of process where we can discuss strategy and not just have our personal differences funneled through bylaw votes that don't really get at the root of who we are and what we're for. So I think this is really good. I think Alameda really deserves a lot of credit. And also thanks for having so many people coming here. Peter mentioned that um, it would be fun to have two of us run against each other for governor. And uh, I, personally, I'm at the phase in my political activism where I've done the candidate thing for a few cycles and I enjoyed it and it was fun being in office as a council member and as a mayor and it was, it was a blessing and I, and I feel really privileged to have that. But right now, um, I think that Peter gave a really good candidate speech. I'm playing a different role in the party right now. I'm trying to be active and be 
one of the many of you who tries to work on our strategy and exchange ideas about how our party can grow. And the questions I think we should be looking at for 06 are, is our voter registration going to go up, depending on our strategy? Is our percentage of the vote going to go up? Are we going to be more successful in publicizing the issues that we care about and moving the debate in the state in which we live so the quality of life for everyone can improve? And the way we do those things, will that actually build our party internally? Not just be good with candidates, but also build our party internally so there's more left over afterwards. And what I want to suggest is that we shift a bit in terms of what races we run and what that message is and how we do it. When you look at the last three election cycles, in 2000, we ran 65 candidates. Of those, on the municipal level, we did well. We won 20 races out of 55. In 2002, municipal and county level, we won 35 races out of 67, more than 50%. And in 2004, we won another 20 out of 67 races. Hopefully, we're going to improve the number of races that we run in on municipal level, and therefore would win. And I think we should be taking Matt myself, other former Greens who have held elected office and spend a little cash and be sending us around the state, community to community, meeting with people and helping develop these local candidacies. I think that's the basic idea. In addition, when we look at the partisan races in which we're, we're in, I think because of the arguments Peter made and all of us do about the war party that's in place on the national level, there is an important role for us to be in congressional races and the U.S. Senate race to make that distinction. But I want to suggest that rather than the ratio that we've had in previous years, where we have been predominantly running for Congress and have not run for the state legislature, I believe strategically this cycle we need to flip the two. When we look at 2000, we ran four congressional candidates and two for U.S. Senate in the contested primary. We only had four candidates for state assembly and nobody for state senate. In 2002, we had six candidates for Congress, and we had eight people on our state slate, which was great, but only three for state assembly. And in 2004, in my opinion, it got worse. We had 14 people running for U.S. Congress. We had only four for assembly and one for state senate. We are both an alternative party and an opposition party, but we are also trying to convince people that we can govern. The reason Green Parties have started around the world is that people in social movements who have done issue activism have felt that the people in power don't represent them. And people have started Green Parties in about 90 countries, not just to say what is wrong with people in the other or what is wrong with their policies, the way they govern, but for us to be in office. And I believe it is incumbent upon us in California to show that we are relevant in California government by showing that we understand not only what the state budget should do in terms of priorities, but how we should fund it. And I believe the way we can do that in 2006, and the challenge that I would toss out to Peter and anybody who's on the state slate, is I believe we need a coordinated process that we develop a common platform that involves the party, the candidates on the state slate, and in my mind, hopefully 20 people who run for state assembly to work on a common alternative tax approach to our state. When you look back at the recall in 2003, one of the things that took Gray Davis out beyond his corruption and beyond his grayness was the fact that we have a structural deficit in this state. And it's not enough for us to say we're for social justice and we would do more to put money for the things we're for. We've had ballot status since 1992. It is far too late for us to show how we will pay for these things and how to do it right. Peter did an excellent job on progressive income tax when he said if the lower 20% paid the same amount as the top 5%, we wouldn't have a deficit. I think that's a great place to start. But as Greens in a state with the kind of population pressure we have, a half million to 600,000 new people a year, we need to confront Proposition 13. And we need to suggest a way to change Prop 13 and link land use policy and tax policy so that we can afford to do what we need to do and so we can push development into a sustainable way that works with the affordable housing jobs. <laughs> what I envision is a working group that puts together state slate people, the people who would run for assembly, take those of us who have been in uh, local office before because a lot of what goes on in the state government impacts local cities' abilities to do the right thing and we've experienced that very directly. One of the reasons the California League of Cities Apartisan, Republicans, Libertarians, Greens, Dems, etc., all got together and 
sponsored a ballot measure to stop the state from stealing money from cities is because it's so clear about what they were doing to us. So add those, add a few people from the platform work group. You've got uh, Dave Wilber, who's here, who's really good on Prop 13 and tax stuff. There are people in our party who know that. Do Prop 13, do progressive income tax, corporate tax, and also, of course, the eco tax that so many of us are familiar with, where we tax environmental pollution, natural resource waste, etc. Redefining progress is in San Francisco. They're experts, World Watch Institute, we could draw from them. I believe that if we go ahead and do that sort of thing, one of the things we see with green parties all over the world is they'll come out with their election platform, and the party has a big press conference, they feature some of their candidates, they have a state or national meeting where they approve such a document, and that becomes a relevant document for that electoral cycle. I believe we need to do that for our party, and that will thus involve us not in um, you know, platform discussions of plenaries that have a lot of stuff that nobody's going to read, but something that's relevant for the 06 cycle. If we want people to run for us, for city councils and for state legislature, there are so many people who are in local office today, who are city staff members, or others who work with those local governments, that if we showed we had a plan that actually made sense and not just four nice things, but could pay for it and could govern, more of those people would be registered green, would come into our party, they would run, and they would get elected. And I think that we need to be looking at that sort of thing. The other angle, in terms of why I believe it's so critical to run state assembly candidates, is as good as our state candidates are going to be in 06, we face a different environment. In 2002, peace and freedom was not on the ballot. That's going to take probably one point or more out of our hide. Number two, the Democrats looked unassailable in 2002 because 98, uh, Gray beat Lundgren by 20 points, no races were close. People didn't expect some of the races to be so close, like Laura Wells' uh, race for controller in 02, and they didn't expect the Dems to lose the governor in 03 and almost losing San Francisco to Matt in 03. Now they've done that. This time they're putting forward some arguably more liberal candidates than they did before. We are not as likely to do as well in the statewide races. And Peter's numbers went down from 5.3 to 2.8 between 02 and 03, in part because of the perception in 03 we have to get Arnold out of that lesser of evil and how do people make those sort of votes. If we run people on a common platform, down ticket for state assembly and some complementary state senate races, those people are going to pick up the votes when Peter's speech turns them on, but they get to the ballot box and they're a little afraid of re-electing Arnold, and they decide to go for Angelini's or whoever the D's put up. We're not going to harvest all that interest if we are top-heavy. So I only don't want us to be top-heavy in terms of only a candidate-driven model for 06, where our state slate, wonderful as they will be, does their thing, but have that integrated deeply within our party. But also the work on the ground by having people to harvest that support and also to do our voter registration. I strongly believe in running for every race on the statewide level, and our numbers, our highest plateau of percentage of registered Greens in the entire state was 1.08% at the apex of Peter's campaign in 03. We are down to 0.95 right now. That's a substantial jump of about 16% of our membership. We are losing because we haven't been running candidates as much, and the debacle as a party, the difficulty and divisions we had in 04, etc., is playing out. So I want us to run aggressive, but we have to run aggressive as a team, and I believe that team needs some down ticket participation. That will grow our party. And obviously, the, the gender and diversity issues with those candidates are paramount. The other thing I'll say, and surprise everybody by um, coming in a little bit under time, which is unlike me, is just um, in, internally. Um, in my county, Los Angeles County, we voted to increase the size of our county council this last year, go back to the 44 people that our council uh, was scheduled to have in 1992. We had shifted it back to 17, and I think it's going to be better for us to have more people out of more districts, etc. What we're going to likely do, and what I'm hoping other counties will do, is one, when you buy your voter reg list, you get the email addresses now that they are harvesting, because the voter reg forms actually have the email addresses. So out of our 28,000 registered greens in LA County, we have 5,000 email addresses already and are growing with that. What I anticipate that we're going to be doing is, and Michael Rockness, who is, is uh, here somewhere, uh, Michael, right there with his hand up. Michael is a very talented Green who helped run the, the Berkeley Greens years ago and came back to, to LA County with us. And he's developing our database. What we envision is going to happen is that we will be sending out to all of our members a notice of when the county council elections are. What are the responsibilities of the county council? How do you actually file to run for those? Then, when people file and run, 
we will actually put their candidate statements on, like those things that we advocate for the general election. So you have your 200 or 300 word statements. Those will be on the web. Those will get emailed to all of our members. I know that there's going to be a lot of enthusiasm because of all the internal factional fights last time about who's controlling the coordinating committee, who's controlling different county councils to have people running independent expenditure committees and influencing county council elections in other people's counties. Say like that's, you know, whatever. That's, that's politics. But I believe that the party infrastructure has the responsibility to have all of our members, not just who is in your faction compared to my faction, fighting about who's going to get on the county council. We went for ballot status, and we went from the 35 locals that founded our party in February 4th, 1990 in Sacramento, to having a responsibility to all of those members. And we have a responsibility to get the information to them and give all of them an opportunity to serve on those bodies. And therefore, I think the model that we're going to use in LA County to let everybody have a chance to know in running these elections is going to be really good. Um, and the cross-file stuff that Peter is uh, raising, I just want to say for me, this is mostly a side issue and mostly a distraction. I think there is an opportunity when we get into the Q&A, um, I'll take some more time to talk about what I think about that, but I don't really care that much about this, and I think that we are being sidetracked as a party um, into seeing things very black and white. Um, I think we've been infiltrated. I think there are people on the state level, the national level, that are being funded to disrupt us, but I don't think that there is the organized Democratic Party plot to change our strategy. I supported Ralph Nader in, in 2004. I recruited Ralph Nader together with Greg Jan and uh, Rob, oh God, one of Ralph's people in, in, in D.C. In, in the fall of 1995. I mean, I was part of that group that did that. And I was all for Ralph. But the fact is, Ralph didn't win in 2004 because when Ralph chose not to go for a nomination in December, that created a vacuum. And he only chose Peter for VP a week before the convention. And there really wasn't enough people to organize for something until the last second. And therefore, when Lynn Serby, our former California Green who ran the COP campaign, was going around state to state and getting him speaking, they won that nomination. Even if the voting process was flawed, even if we should have improved the way we did for the convention. The fact is, they won that internally as Greens. And I wasn't a supporter of COP. I actually couldn't watch it. I stayed behind the curtain and cried on somebody's shoulder because I was so depressed about it. And that was my shtick. But I don't think that there is a current that wants lesser of evilism and wants us to go to the Democrats in a big, organized way. I think they're individual opinions. And I think that it's unfortunate that I'm being painted as a leader of some current there. If we don't do the cross battle thing, you know, it's not a big deal, really, in my mind. I think there's a couple of opportunities from that to publicize the portion representation. And I'd like to try and use it to do it. But if we don't do it, you know, no man part that. It's not that big a deal. I think the big deal is spending too much more time thinking that there's this big internal debate about whether we're pure or not, and not spending time on recruiting candidates from the municipal race <laughs> and getting those 20 state assembly candidates, half of which are women, so that we can actually be functional on the ground in 06. That's what I hope we would do, and that's why I've taken a strategic uh, approach to today's uh, discussion, and I look forward to the remainder of our dialogue. Thank you very much. Um, Mike, um, I'm going to pose about three questions to you, and then Peter's going to respond on these same subjects. Um, first of all, I want to ask you, you raised the question of the, uh, some of the factors to look at um, of how the party is growing, the uh, membership, the number of candidates that we're fielding, and I want to ask you, uh, why is that? Why is that relevant in your opinion? I mean, presumably, if the Green Party has certain values and we're defending those values, and our membership is getting smaller, uh, I would hope that you're not suggesting that we should become more like one of the parties we oppose simply to boost our membership. And I know that's not what you were saying. I just want to put it out there. The second thing I want to ask you is, you talk about state assembly versus Congress. It seems to me that oftentimes the Greens are criticized because we field candidates in state or local races that are talking about foreign policy. And while foreign policy is related to what happens in a municipality or in the state, it seems like one of the strengths of the Green Party is our ability to talk about things like the war. What better race to do that than in a congressional race? And um, on the first point about why increase our membership base, when we went for ballot status, we had to get 78,992 people to choose to register Green in California to get on the ballot. 
And those of us who were around back then remember what a thrilling and exhausting and nerve-wracking thing that was about would we qualify or not, because we got 65,000 in the last two and a half months and 40,000 in the last month to make it. But we stopped after that. We stopped. And if we kept doing it, I think we'd have a million people in the party. The people who are likely to vote for us start by self-identifying as Greens. That's one place. Number two, the amount of work we have to do. Every time you go to a working group meeting, there's a handful of people who take the lead, there's a lot of other people who don't. If we talk about being a movement party, that means having thousands of people who take ownership of the party and who do the work. And right now, with the numbers we've had, we have both not organized those people we have, but we haven't also gone ahead and got, got more people. And I think that our base should be bigger, obviously it should be bigger, it should be taken more seriously when we argue for proportional representation, public financing, Tip my hat to Joe Chamberlain, who works has been doing to make sure we get a public financing bill that works for us. If our numbers are bigger, because what um, Bob Mulholland, one of the state Democrat Party hacks, keeps saying is, look, they haven't grown. The registration is staying at the same number. On the congressional race, I believe we should run strong congressional candidates and pick out those Dems who have the worst record. But what I want to change is the anemic number of candidates in a state of 35 million people with 160,000 grades we have that we're running. So if we run 15 congressional candidates, I still want to run 20 assembly candidates. I just think the ratio between Congress and state assembly is wrong, and we're not showing we're relevant in this state where people live. And that means even the media will cover us more seriously if it shows we know what we're talking about, we're just not against war and for peace, but we can deal with real issues on the ground here, and others will take us seriously as well. On the... I want you to address two issues. The um, question of how important the factors about party growth are to help guide the party in what it's doing, and then if you could make a comment about the State Assembly versus Congress point. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. At our plenary, Mike Feinstein gave a report for the candidates and campaign working group, which, as all of you know, would not let me have time at the San Francisco meeting on strategy for 2006. He gave the report, and he said, we run too many people for Congress. We should run more people for Assembly. It is wrong to counterpose them. Right now, with the public going anti-war and the Democrats be a party of war, we should run as many people as possible for Congress. Dean Meyerson has put out a call to run in every congressional seat in the country. I agree with him. Even if they're standing candidates, let everybody have a chance to vote for a candidate for a party that's pro-peace. And he's going to tell the world. He's going to tell the world. He's going to tell the These two parties did this war. You now oppose it in your majority. Vote for the party that opposed it. I think we should run for all these offices. Not. I think it's very important to do as much as we can. And of course, the point that we should be running for seven is true. About the growth of the party. The party will grow if people see in it principled politics. If they see over time that the party stands consistently for them. When they begin, they, see the way these things happen isn't gradual. Then you have one percent, then you have one and a half, then you have two, then you have two and a half. So something will happen, crisis which we can't predict. The Green Party has established itself. It has 65, let's say three or four years ago, five years from now, it has 120, 150 people elected. Principal stand all the time. And one day something happened and people crack. Some major labor leader says, I'm fed up like that people did. I'm running for governor. As agree, and we rally, and all of a sudden, a three-wheel, three-way race happens, and we get a governor elected. People start going, oh my God, the Greens can win. I mean, I can see Matt Gonzalez making it to Congress. Yeah. And I think yeah. there's people... That we are against the Democrats and Republicans, that we are against the corporate candidates, and we tell people, you make your choice. You join that party, we don't support you. That's my position. The final point about the centralization, I think, is probably the biggest concern I have in the difference with the direction that I think the state slate might lead us compared to what I'm suggesting here is. If our party's going to grow, it means more people are involved and have ownership of the product. Part of the reason we're in the Green Party is we want a different model from the candidate-driven model of the other parties. Our sister and brethren Green Parties around the world come up with common election platforms that their candidates run on. It's all over the planet. I think we would be stronger, rather than having 
Peter develop a position paper and the slave develop what they're going to do independently of the rest and then say, oh, another slave with a different view. I'm not for a different view. I'm for a common view. And I think as Greens, there are green approach to land use planning and taxation that is real work for us, real world work, that if we work together and use our best brains, that will build our party with credible issues, credible process, credible involvement, more people feeling ownership. That's the kind of society we talk about creating, and our whole model of the Greens is trying to practice that internally. So I don't think it is centralization. I think it is democratization and inclusiveness to have the kind of process, including statewide candidates, other people who are knowledgeable about the issues, and the state slate together. It's something that announces that we're together in a perspective. Thank you.